praise the lord praise the lord amen and amen shall we go to micah chapter number 4 that's for the last time today Micah 4, we'll read again verse 1 and verse 2. It sounds like a reciter, I think. Eh? It says, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths. So that's our concentration, nearly another portion which says, He will teach us of his ways and we shall walk in his paths. We thank you for this word in Jesus' name. Amen. We, we're concluding today on what we started 12 weeks ago. Time flies, eh? It's been three months already. We started talking about um, the mountain of the house of the Lord. And like I said to you when I started and I've been saying throughout, or my aim here is to resell to you the want to be taught than anything else. I mean, that's what I've been trying to sell to you. Look, let's come to church and let us just allow ourselves to be taught. I have actually made a lot of uh, plays around that and also tried to sell it so much that when we are taught, there are things that can only come to pass to those who are taught. And I have actually tried to answer a number of questions, but like I've always said, you know, we will not, even if we speak for the whole year, we won't be able to speak to everybody. Maybe some of you have been coming here and we never said anything to you. Well, from next week, something will be said to you. But I've been trying to say to you, you know what, the best that can ever happen in a person's life is being taught. We know today how teaching plays a very important role in the corporate world out there where a piece of paper determines whether you'll get the job or not, which is called a certificate or a degree. And some of you have got a lot of those in your cabinets at home, just too much. And those are what paying your salary, basically. I can realize about that. But without them, uh, it was not going to be possible. And we also know that uh, being a South African citizen is not enough. I, I, say, I, say, I say on those merits only that you'll be given a job. So when it comes to the things of the Lord, we need to carry the same mentality to know that being taught will make you a better person by God. And that's why the Bible also speaks about uh, teaching our children it speaks about Jesus going out and teaching. It speaks about Paul. He taught. I mean, we, we see teachings all around us. And like I said to you some weeks ago, when we, we were born again in the 80s, um, we just went to church to be taught every Sunday. Our faith grew around the teachings. Our character was molded by teachings. You remembered what was said and you wanted to practice it. And by practicing what you were taught, you became a better person. And we were able to go to the home cells. What happened to home cells? We were being taught. We found small groups. We were being taught. Church never had so many frills like they have today. Back then, there were no many, too many things. There were not too many things like body, couples, fellowship, etc. It was just like being taught. It was simple. And we grew. And looking back some 30 years later, the ministry of teaching has almost died at the hands of preachers. And like I said when I started, I cannot blame them because of you, the consumers of the gospel, 
have determined the flow of trading. You know, you could be going to a flea market, but unless you see what you want, you won't buy from anyone else who's got what they want to sell you. So this, was the, this is where the church finds itself. You, the consumer, has actually pressurized those who are preaching the gospel to preach what you want to hear. And this is what, uh, what is happening. That's the normal flow today. And uh, that's why Kola, the minister of teaching, has taken a slight dip. But by the grace of God, I believe that there's a lot of teachers out there who will find their path back to the, to the pulpit and begin to equip the church for days ahead, even these very days that we're living in. Unless you have a strong foundation in God, you may not survive. Wherever you go today, you will find evil all around you. There's evil in the toilets, evil everywhere. Evil at the zoo. Evil in the school bus. I mean, there is no way you can just go and find a clean environment. And they, that is why those who have been taught will be able to survive. The, 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 the generation, you know, we will be able to survive this generation. We also said... Um, number of things like the benefits of being taught. I said one of them was it teaches us the language of God. Remember that one? That you hear when a person speaks, whether they have been taught about God or not. Today, when two Christians are talking, even on the social media, it's about their preachers more than about the preaching because there is no preaching. There's no longer the word. Christians don't talk about the word anymore. If they ever talk about church, or you went to that church, the people don't care anymore about the quality. We've been taught to, to look at uh, uh, mega churches are somehow better than small churches, which is a myth. You know that we, we no longer look at the real thing as to, I went to church and my, the word. No, they go like, wow, crowds. That's why everybody wants to get big now, which might not happen to everybody because God has made us caretake us over different divisions, of course. But what's important is whether we belong to a small, medium, or a mega church, are you being made ready for heaven? The day you leave this church, are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go join other crowds in hell? Many people have gone out there. So we also said it teaches us and creates faith in us. Only through teachings are we going to develop faith. That's, if you find a faithless Christian, anybody who has no faith or hope, know this one thing. Either they are not taught or they are resistant to being taught. Are you aware of that? And I leave some people where they are never taught and you can't blame them because everything they say is what they know. And everything they know is what they've been taught. Also, there are others, by the way, they are, as much as they've been taught, their hearts are not in it. It's like a person going to the movie and discovering what is boring. Then you're either in the movie, but then they're on the phone. So you wonder if you have to be in the movie to be working on the phone or the other way around. Now, I came, but I got disappointed for some reason. So these are some of the things we need to guard against. And that's why we need to be forever conscientized around the importance of going to church. Why do we come to church? Networking is something else. But why? What's the core of us coming to church? Why do we wake up in the morning and we say we go to church? Are we going to sing? No. We might sing, yes. Some of you can't sing. This one alien, so. You just go with the fruit. Let's say, fast but the core of coming to church is not in the singing. It is in what we're doing now. To, be, to, be, to, to sit down and be instructed in the things of the Lord, which are going to make you a competent husband, competent wife, a competent kid at home, a competent neighbor, a competent employee, a good boss at work, a person with a conscience on the traffic. You know that some of us who, are, who actually use bikes more, whenever I have an appointment, maybe like out of, so just about mid early during the week, I take the bike. I see bitter people in cars. 
Peter. You wonder if they want to be where I am. They're sitting in the traffic and they're blaming everybody for it. And some of them are Christians. How do I feel? I want to st uh, stick us up papa at the back. To so say this person has been like blocking me, not allowing me to come in. They are a convert, yes, some papa somewhere. But if the teachings that the preacher were actually changing them, have you ever noticed that just giving way, more trafficking, for somebody to go before you could take a split second? It's exactly 30, 30 milliseconds. It's not even much. But when you are bitter and you don't have God in you, it means everything. You can never allow anybody. But but now the sad thing is that some of them could be Christians. And you know, they become Christians on Sunday, but they become Peter during the week. And why? Because they are never taught. The Bible says being kind, some of you, would entertain angels. What, what if I'm an angel on a bike? So, we also said, um, it's going to make you a better person. I, I said that in Pajikara. It's Teaching makes you a better person. Makes you sharp. Makes you, makes you, gives you the edge over, over the works. Not the edge over other Christians, but over the works of the devil. You are able to spot if it's God or the devil or a person or error is being spoken. Unless you are taught, you will never know all that. Are you okay with that? So I'm going to try to pull three today for the next few minutes. One being teaching brings healing from sickness, disease, and oppression. Two, it cleanses you. And three, it lights your path. There's a quality with people who know the word. That only people who know the word will be able to see the quality in those people. In the book of Psalms, chapter one, number 107, I would like to also continue to re-emphasize this. That there was a time when God dealt with men without middle men. Men, there was that time when God dealt with his people and there were no middle men at all. When God dealt with Abraham, Abraham never had a pastor. Abraham never went to church. Abraham was never a member of it. There were no churches back then. When God dealt with his first man, Adam, in the garden, there was no church of Eden. There was no pastor in Eden. There were no elders. There, were no there was nothing. When God dealt with Samson, there was no church. Samson was never, never a member of any church. You name any, any person in the Old Testament. Up to the point that when Jesus came, there was no church. Just as Now, what, my, what I'm, am I driving at is that look at the impact that people made or the impact that God made through people before church came. And so many things that God did back then that we're reading of in the Bible today, things where just God and man met together and things happened. These were not church people. They are written down here. Their testimonies have been read throughout the world. And they never went to church. The Canaanite woman who refused just to give up, she never went to any church. The centurion who said to Jesus, don't come to my house, speak the word. He never went to any church. Absolutely. Yet today we read, we are church people. We read about people who never went to church. Who are better than us? Why is it that church era seems to be falling short? Should we die off? Of course we are going to die off. Should we die off? And a few more pages are inspired. God inspires a few more people to add some pages to the Bible about the present day church. What shall it be said about us? Are we going to come out as a better generation? 
against those who never went to church? Why am I saying this? Because I believe the church becomes the pinnacle of the relationship of God and man. Jesus came as God on earth, and he established a church so that his kingdom should come. He taught the disciples, let the kingdom come. So church should be a reflection of what heaven is like. Church people should be more like angels than devils. Church is the ultimate of what, how sin is going to be defeated in the natural. After he said that he died and he went to heaven and the Holy Spirit came down and the church today and he said whenever two or three of us to gather together in his name, Jesus said, I will be there in your midst. This is the only time God ever fellowshiped with men on a full-time basis. Are we becoming better though? The, the ch chances are no. And the question is why? We've mentioned a number of reasons in the beginning of this lesson as to how you pressurize preachers and how preachers miss the whole mark of allowing God to be God in church. How preachers have become gods in churches and they're being worshipped and they're more visible than the, than, than, than the Christ who's supposed to be uh, the, 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 the core of the meetings. So this is how we messed up even what God meant for our good. And now, remember this one. You can never mess up God's things and have an organized life. Never. It's not possible. You can't be the best person and mess up into somebody. You are going to be like what you do to God. What, you shall reap what you sow. You mess up the church of Jesus. Your own life shall be... Not that God, God doesn't avenge himself on people. If God wants to avenge himself on us, we'll be no more. But he's put laws, laws that are called the laws of sowing and reaping. You shall reap what you sow. So most people today expect God to treat them better while they are treating God's business bad. And there is no way you can, you can be better also. You'll never be better than the church you go to. It's not possible. Because better is not an English word. Better is, an, is a biblical way. It's only God who can make people better. Improvement comes from the Lord and nowhere else. So you can never live beyond the teachings of the, way of the church. The best you can be, the Bible speaks about a student not being better than his teacher. The best they can be is to be just like their teacher. So there are so many things that are stalling our lives. So most Psalms 107, it speaks about the generation that, that was before us. Now, God has seen bad situations, horrible situations. God has seen terrible things. God has seen nations in confusion. God has seen families in, dis, in disarray. He has seen lives of individuals which could not be untangled again unless he moved in. And we look, at from, we look from the book of Genesis up to where we stand today, about 107 Psalms. Or at any given time during those times when people needed God, he could have done something else. Why choose to send this word? Why would God look at the situation and just begin to speak a word on the situation? Why can't he just come around and, 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 and show the seriousness of the situation? Put seriousness in the context here, human beings. You get the point? Like, you know, when you know, you know, you know, you know that you, know, you need God's intervention. And you're not prepared to hear the word. You want some action. Why would God still choose to send his word and just speak the word? Are you aware of we're looking down on something that should be helping us? And that's why even today, people would not be happy if they are sick and you say, go and be healed. We were talking in the about one about the laying on of hands, that if there's something really in your hands, it should be there. Good enough. Why should you stick your hand until somebody falls? Does it take that much to throw it? At Is it like some kind of juice or whatever? Like siphoning petrol from a, from a car. 
If there is really something, why is electricity so fast to react? Whether it's a finger or it will catch you. If it's there, it's going to be there. But why would God decide to ignore all that and just use the word? Is it that we are looking so much down on the word? That we want something else. Are we that generation that Jesus spoke of? Uh, an evil and adulterous generation will always ask for a sign. But then he said to them, there will be no sign given to you except the sign of Jonah. Show us some miracle. And like I have said in the past, I've seen miracles. But I've never seen them change people. We've laid hands on the sick. We've spoken. They were actually, most, more than laying hands, we used just to speak the word. And people were healed. But they, somehow, the, 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 the demand became much more than the supply. We would leave church at half past five in the evening, believe it or not. Church would start at 10, would be home run to at six in the evening. After saving the customers. Some were drunk on the Holy Ghost. Some were running around and chasing, uh, hitting walls with their heads. Some were just there watching it, everything, and, and enjoying the scenery. But we would go home and do some stock taking. And we would look back and see the worthlessness of a generation. But what's the point? Because next week, they're in the same queue again. Two weeks later, they've called their friends and their neighbors. It's like, but you, and they were not changing at all. So we need to get to that point, church, where we will remember how God dealt with people. And the Bible calls him an unchanging God. And the fact that God introduces some ordinances along the way, he does not do away with the original plan. I said to you last week, there's, two weeks ago, there's something between a complete main ingredient in everything. I said to you, the main ingredient in our work with God is faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to walk with God. Christian life is not a walk with God. It's serving God. God is not selling franchises. That you walk with him and later on you can actually do whatever you want as long as you sell the, the product. No, he is the main boss. We're all serving him. So in our relationship with God, we're going to need the main ingredient, which is faith. And as soon as you touch the subject of faith, you will never avoid to speak about the subject of the word. So Psalms 107 verse 17 to 20 says, Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. It speaks about the generation that was working with God long before we came. They loathed all food. They drew near the gates of death. They had no appetite for everything they had. Isn't that what we see in this generation? Those who have ma enough money have discovered that there is no healing in money. Those that have got houses have discovered that there is houses but no peace. Those that have nothing can tell there's peace, but they want something. So it's like we could have like a, a, a day where we say, okay, all of those who have money, one side, who have money but who can't find satisfaction from it, come to the left. Those who have all peace and are broke, come to the right. Guys, swap. They will never want to swap. Because they, they find out, I cannot keep both at the same time. That's, a, that's, that's the reality of life. That our peace, our progress in the Lord, our relationship with God, can only be managed by God. Because it says now here, they, they were hungry. 
if they had no appetite. Ogulja, the guanyanisa, the loathed food. They, they, they could puke by just looking at food. And then turn over to another key Hoshan, a little suit, Kimas of Hoshan. Hoshan, I'll tell you now, Pastor Chris, don't worry. No, but tell Pastor Chris Hoshan, what's over here? When you go to the party and you eat everything, everything, there's some kind of burping which comes out like a fat. It's burping, but it smells like fat out of your mouth. Something like that. It's terrible. Good when they looked at food, they felt like they were farting through their lips, their mouth. That's how much of everything they had and how much of God's grace they lacked. Good one day in Africa, they were dear Mekar. So good God looked at them and he saw people nearing the point of death, people frustrated, people who had what they wanted, but who derived no satisfaction from everything that, and then they began to cry out to God. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. How did he save them? He sent his word and healed them. And not only that, because the word is not only a healing, has healing power, he says the word only has rescue power. And he rescued them through the word. I wish the scripture could have said he sent angels. I can't we walk by sight, Rona, not by faith. But people who walk by faith know that the word, they know that the angels they expect to appear were created by the word. Bible calls God, the father of Jesus, it says his son is the, is the word. In the beginning was the word and all things were created by him. And everything that was ever created was made by him. We know that, we know the Bible tells us God was always there, but he began to create. So everything he made, his son Jesus helped him to make. Jesus is called the word. So when we speak the word, we speak Jesus, the person. So where there is word, we don't need to have any proof. We are flesh. But we are so much of a visual generation that unless we see something, we will not be satisfied. And that is why today people will put bangles around your wrists, strings around your waist. Imagine, Anje, the worst thing that can ever happen is for you to marry somebody who has to wired. That could be worse. Mary, this slave queen can teach she's wired. And you're just going to discover after the I do's and the thou may kiss the bride. Megati is in yoga. Because people want to touch. People don't just want to believe. And that is what even today, I'm wondering if anybody could wire you only on the wrists and not wire you around the waist. So it's like, no, no, you're out of the box. And in that trouble, he sent his word, and he healed them, and he rescued them from the grave. Now, the question here would be, how do we receive the word, and how do we know if it is the word of healing and the word of rescue? This is where you should not sleep in church. Because as I've spoken right now, I want any revelation. That's exactly what God does. The word you hear, you hear, you catch, you say, wow, I received that. And the word comes into you. The word, the word is the only medicine. You receive the word, even if, even if the word is not relevant to your situation. Let me be honest with you. If you are going to drink petrol, you don't have to be a car to run. You are going to have to have to, to after drink that petrol. It's going to work in you the way petrol is supposed to work in humans. They designed it for cars. But petrol has a certain work it does. Even to Drink it is a bone. 
I'm a good to me. You want to drink and boom, boom, so live for power. Never. But it's going to do what it does to humans. You get the point? Though it was meant for cars. So the word I'm speaking here might not be meant for your situation. According to your head. Just take it. After the word has gone into you, the word will work in you. What is supposed to work according to how the word was designed to work in you and in your situation? And that's why there must be no moment of you sitting down and, and, and just thinking about home. You sit there and you just swallow the word. You don't have to understand it. When a baby drinks poison, they, don't, they can't read the contents of the, bo the bottle. The contents are, are dangerous. Do not drink. Babies don't know. If, if I was going to be fair, Nikita, the babies shouldn't die from self-poisoning. But they die. Why? Because poison is supposed to work. Whether you know or not. So if poison could work against your ignorance, don't you think the word can work against your ignorance? You just receive the word. Whether you can figure it out or not, it's going to work. Just drink it. Kame sanje wena that word is going to heal you once you've drank it the word will go, go into your body your body was meant in such a way naturally that it sort of like begins to do the accounting and sifts and everything and separates and calculates and everything and sends to the whole of the body takes whatever is not needed sends it out of the body that's how you if your natural body works like that how much more about the spirit of man the spirit of man, it can separate, can do everything and take the word that is relevant. Send it to the correct part. Then one day you woke up in the morning and as you wake up, you are amazed at how this mountain that stood before you seems like a hill. And nobody has ever spoken against the mountain. But because you took a dose of the word that was going to make this mountain to go smaller, like a tumor in your life, smaller and smaller until it was gone completely. That's the purpose of this. So when he sends his word, it says he healed them and he rescued them from the grave. Other translations are from all their troubles. So it doesn't have to be we speak against every challenge. No. We could simply say, Wena, you are not to be plundered. Wena, you are a chosen generation. The word comes in. Then the what happens to a chosen person? They cannot be plundered. Their husband cannot be stolen. I don't know, why, why do they steal husbands? Only husbands are stolen. Guys, guys, please wake up, man. I've never heard anybody say, they stole my wife. It's always they stole my husband. Now do you actually steal some 90 kilograms do the movies? Just imagine. Now. <laughs> anyway, but that's the word works. That's my point. I have told about this testimony many times. And I don't think you should get bored of it. Because Genesis chapter number 1, verse 1, it says the same thing. Lord. Every time you go to Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created it. So I don't have to have a new testimony. If I don't have, I have to tell the same old testimony I had. It's only Genesis chapter 1, John 14. I told, her, I told this uh, some many years ago, I think it's, it's, it's even one of my books, about around 2005 how I was plagued by so many diseases. I mean, I was sick. I was sick to the point of death. 2004 to be particular. Actually, after the whole, those of you who were here when we were still doing both healing and deliverances. Remember how it used to be hectic? The truth is, those demons followed me to my home every time. I would be standing here, casting out demons, seeing healings. It was like being a twala. You won't get me twala me. Because as much as the, the victory was obvious, behind the scenes, the sufferings were heavy. I was afflicted bodily. I, I was just, my life was ebbing away. Sharp, sharp, just ebbing away. We were having demonic uh, attacks in the house. 
Nje, it was just like there was trouble all over Nje. But the greatest challenge was my health. I remember once I went to a doctor, I couldn't sleep at night, and when I woke up in, in, during the night, I couldn't breathe. I, was, I, I couldn't breathe in or out. You know, it was bad. Just like choking, not breathing in or out. I sat up there, just woke up in the evening, and we spoke, and I said, I can't breathe. I went to the doctor the next morning, called the Sadie Clinic, um, Dr. Ratzela. And he checked me, and they made me blow into a pipe, and he said, Mona, you are a chronic asthmatic person. I said, no. Then he says to me, how long have you been asthmatic? Then I said, Mona, look, I only started to feel this last. He said to me, no, look, it's not possible. Your lungs are the lungs of a person who's been asthmatic for years. He showed me the, the, the percentage. He said, no, you know, you can't even blow up to here. And I, but honestly speaking, I never had asthma all my life. I don't have asthma even now. I had asthma for one night. A chronic for that matter. So, he put me on medication. The next thing I had, um, slipped discs. There was pain on my lower back here. I consulted with doctors. I was first went to a physiotherapist. They tried to do physiotherapy. It didn't work. Checked me. Then they said, no, you've got a slip disc. Uh, it's pinching the nerve. You've got to go for an operation. I was literally falling apart like EPM. I wanted a cushion. I was falling apart like a cushion, literally. This, that. I mean, there was... I, I, I couldn't sleep at night, started putting cushions under my back here. The next thing you have got this disease and that, too many things. And at that particular point, the worst thing was, I did not have a pastor. You get the point? I never had a pastor. When I were fortunate, you had one. You could go to, he could give you a hug. You could speak a positive word over you. Now at that time, I never had a pastor. So I, there was oh, literally nowhere to go to. I had to stick with God. And I began to, you know, well, I would go and get medication, but I began to speak to God about my situation. I began to talk to Mudim and say, Mudim, you know what? Do something if you can. And then I, was, by that time we had moved to Sans, uh, one of the townhouses around, around the king. Okay, Sunset Vale. So, we are sitting in the house and every time I'm and about it. But one thing I have never, I have never done was to abandon prayer. The Bible says men should always pray and faint not or get, never get tired. And I took it like literally as a hiring man addressing me, gender as a man. Have you ever noticed how men fear to pray? They would go and buy the fiercest dog. I mean, when you compare your dog and prayer, your dog is actually even more dangerous. Anyway, so I kept speaking to God in prayer every time, speaking to God in prayer. So by that time, we, you know, the house was a bit small. Turn so Joyce would pray in the lounge. I'd pray, oh, he, she'd pray in the bedroom and pray in the lounge. Because we, 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 we just have different praying styles. She walks around. I'm the kind of person who sits down. I switch off the light. She prays with the light on. So you can turn as a new argue. So we're totally different. So I would sit in the lounge there, then she'd be in the bedroom, then I would switch off the light. And I told you this story, and I want to tell it again to those that are here for the first time. But maybe if you heard it for the 20th time, I'm thinking for the 21st time, and maybe there's a reason for that, that you should link it to what we're saying today. Then we're sitting there, it's around 12-ish, 1-ish in the morning. Sitting there, I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying. The lights are off and a sound you know when there's when there's too much wind outside and you can feel the you feel that well, well, the, morning, the roof begins you feel like the wind is just going to take off the roof then you begin to 
hear the creaking, the squeaking of, of, the, of the roof. The, the sound like that started to happen. It was like there was a powerful wind outside and the roof began to creak a little bit. But now you are inside the house, you don't worry about that. You're not just continuing to sit there and I prayed. But something unexpected happened. Just like that, the ceiling began to shift. And I was, alone, I'm, I was not sleeping, neither did I have too much garlic. I was not allergic to anything that I know, so I couldn't have been hallucinating. For now, let me pause it there. I could have been hallucinating maybe, but let's see the results of the hallucinations that thing after. Then the roof, the, the, the ceiling began to move from the right. The ceiling moved off. Like, like a sliding roof, like gone, the ceiling. Then the next thing that followed, the, the, the roof itself began to move away. Now you're sitting on a sofa. It's like now I'm glued onto this sofa. I want to run, but I can't. So then the roof goes, and very slow, like slowly goes, and then, then you begin to feel the wind blowing in the house, and you see the stars and everything, and you're inside, and you know you're dead. Dead. What's going to feel it, man? As soon as cars are going to go to police. I will call the <laughs> And then I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking outside, and I see a figure from afar, a human figure, coming down very slow, coming down. And I, 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 this roof here, it's about, this roof here, and up to the pitch, 18 meters. Yeah, that's the, the apex on like 18 meters. I think around, um, say, 10, 15 meters. This person comes, then stops mid-air. Then I'm able to see him. People have asked me to describe, you, you know the Malay, Malay people? Yeah, he looked Malay, black, black. Uh, not white, not black, but not, not blackberry. But, but more like yellow bonish. He's wearing white, white, very white, satin, satin robe with a thick gold sash. Belt, a thick robe, a thick gold around his waist. I think he was wearing, he was wearing his sandals and he, his eyes were like like the LED lamps, yeah, for now, yeah, for now, because the LED, because the bed, they, 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 we never had LED, but they were so sharp. And he's just suspended there looking at me, and I'm stuck in the chair. I cannot run, I cannot scream. And then he, he just beckons with his hand, he does this. When he does this, Pastor Chris, the chair rises. The sofa rises, manga. When he does this, the sofa rises with me inside the sofa. The sofa goes, lifts off. Now I'm holding on. I'm conscious all the time. You know that? Then the sofa goes, goes, goes. And I look back and I see the house. The whole house, the space where the sofa was. I'm looking back and there's, I'm seeing South Gate. I'm seeing the whole complex. I'm seeing the neighboring complexes, um, mid NG. As the sofa kept going up, it reached a point where we were something like five meters away from each other. Then he just does that with his hand, then the sofa stops. He is the most peaceful person in the eyes, not saying a word. He is, his face is assuring, Jay. Then he just looks at me with that peace in his eyes. Then after what seemed like eternity, I'm sounding poetic now. What, what seemed like eternity, he beckons me back. As he does that, the sofa begins to go down as slow as it went up. Very slow, very slow. And the temperature changed. Then the roof begins to close. When the roof closes, I did the obvious. Now I was myself stood immediately, switched the life, ran into the bedroom. I choose a rappel. 
or nasa feris nasa feris i can't amurku bon kitimal bon and that's it then i'm i'm beginning to to hear the go 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 then my heart is going like go 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 and i i i'm i'm telling myself i almost died i almost died then i couldn't sleep you are in bed but you you're not sleeping then your mind is racing you asking questions what who could it be and, and something down near just said to me that that's jesus why did he come i don't know but then i wake up the next morning and be, believe believe you me before up to the point where he came i could not tie my shoelaces i could not bend like this i had to sit down to, to reach because the discs were horrible i had a pump the asthma so i woke up the next morning and immediately i stand up kikenya dieta and i'm amazed that i took the shoes like that but you your mind your mind has to be aware of what you can do that you could not do before but in all honesty god sure and that was 2005 2005 i don't remember the month properly i noticed from that day that every disease that i ever had was no longer there i could do things i would never do before my chest was clear the peace that came upon me things just began to come together we had a better finances at house the i mean just god just came through for us and uh, during that period that was you know when we were going to us building our first house and it became a miracle we put up a huge we put up a huge house we put up like five levels yan to ka i'm not i cannot even explain it you know people would think no mfuni sha 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 manje when we talk miracles miracles is when god intervenes on your behalf and you can never explain it for it is from heaven and it changes your life and those of you who been to our house know we, that's from that on we were able to put up that house that we've been planning to put in no time the house was up we moved in and we're looking at our bank balances it was impossible literally impossible because while we built that house it was like we built it from the meager income that we had that's ch- small change then we put up a house which is worth millions today and the things God did kana kwenye na he just just piled up mercy and upon mercy upon our lives and he never said a word but he sent his word So so you say, you you send here and um, and you become desperate desperate that people could actually just catch a glimpse of what you are trying to say when you so when you go like you know the word of god can change your situation like somebody said one word from god can change the rest of your life but now how much are you willing to believe how much are you willing to stand on the word How much are you, are you just willing to stand on the word and say God my your will not my will be done in my life and I'm not saying today my life is trouble free no there, there are seasons there are seasons you come out of that season a mountain top season next thing you know you're down in the valley You're down in the valley and you're the shortest person in the valley and everything is up and all your enemies and every situation are against you now they are on the mountains they are looking down at you but you know that uh, your redeemer lives isn't it and that at the end and the end you will he will stand and even though your torn maybe maybe your flesh may be torn away he shall restore you and i have never suffered sickness and disease since 2005 nothing I was thinking somebody get I, I don't even know what flu is like. I yeah, I do have blocked nose from time to time. Do I give it attention? Hell no. 
I don't want to go and share Satan's issues. So what I'm saying is now, you, you walk in this kind of thing, and you've never had anybody lay hands on you. All you've ever had was just to stand your ground until God showed up. And I'm not saying he will show you the same thing. That's why we miss the mark. I can't promise you that. I cannot. Every time I've shared, people have gone like, ah, oh, that's not true. Maybe I was hallucinating, but after the hallucination, here's a testimony. So I'm saying to you today, you know, we, we, we need to stand on the word of God. God said it. And whether you believe it or not, it's his word. And you do not have to have a specific word. Okay. And please, I'm not the major one. There's somebody here, your son is very silly. Hey, there's a silly son in every family. When I receive the word, which is able to save even your very soul, get the word. Like you may, you may think, no, no, I'm not a car. So I can't drink petrol and it can actually change me. Take the word. And I'm saying to you, like I said before, petrol was not meant for human beings. It presents you when I was born. Just drink it, you'll see. It's going to work. Not like cars, but it's going to work you like a human being. You go to the, they tell people in, in Pusi Petrol, but we have one again. So... <laughs> We need to only, to, 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 no, we, 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 when our only focus is on God's word, then rest assured that God and his word will never fail us. Our focus must be on his word. God said it. God said it. So you leave home on Sunday morning, you come to church. Put the networking for after church. Put everything else for after church. On your mind, on your mind, let the priority be God. Speak a word. That will heal my situation. You must speak a word into my situation. Then you don't let, you sit there like a merchant. You don't let any word escape you. Receive every word because that word we speak might not be relevant to your situation. But God knows why we speak that word. And we've seen, we've seen testimonies. We, 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 we used to live in a house called Deep Klufu. Oh, Uncle Siam. Have you ever lived in hell? When we embarked on the journey of building our house, we were living in Morocco North. So we sold the house at Morocco North. And then we moved to Deep Cliff in a free house that was offered by a brother. A big, big house. About 200 square meters of house. It was huge. We were comfortable, but we had to deal with spirits in that house. For starters, when we moved into the house, the guy, the gentleman gave us the key. Only one key. Watch the other They only have one key. The other keys are not present. So it was the key, your yeah, front door. The other doors, they locked from the inside. So we went there excited to really try to open the house and, wow, bigger than our house. Wow, for free. Uh, I would rather live with demons. Mind be free, Never. One must go. I don't see how demons can chase you from your own house. Not unless you are not word-based. If you are word-based, that house is yours. You've got the title deed. Satan must show up a title deed. Demons must bring a title deed. Then we can have an argument. Or else, whoever doesn't have the title deed must go. Every place where the soul of my food treads upon, I will own it for that time, be it temporarily or otherwise. I'll stay there peacefully. I, the, 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 the demons will come back after I have left. So we moved into this house during the week. We cleaned nicely. We found that the house was upside down. So, so, but we cleaned it up nicely, you know, excited, washed it. We just made the house ready. And then in one of the bedrooms, there was a blanket. There was a blanket in one of the bedrooms. So somebody was sleeping on the blanket. A blanket. 
and some bottle of Coca-Cola there. We cleaned the bedroom, we took the blanket, we rolled it up nicely to put it somewhere else. I don't even remember where, but not in that same bedroom. We locked the whole house from the out inside as we were instructed, shut all the windows, used the front door to come out and lock. And it, it had a, a door and a grill. We locked, made sure the house is secured. We left. When we brought our clothes, the house was unlocked. I mean, you can tell when there's trouble. The blanket that, we, that was in that bedroom was back there. There were three leaves. There was no trees in the property, but there were three leaves in the kitchen. As if somebody would land there, what? Pulling your what? Tell, la penne, what? Tell, what? Tell. Then I called the gentleman. I can't find him on the phone. But then I find the wife. I say, oh, push one bun. She says to me, no, I'm not, but Eman, we've got a bit of a challenge, Eman. Do you guys have spare keys for the house? She says, what? I don't know, we don't have. I, then she said, where's the Halein? I mean, that's the worst, that's, that, that's one question you don't want at that point because you've already moved out from where you stayed. Then I tell her, then she says, oh, that's fine. Tell my husband. I've been telling him. Oh, Lord. Yo. So have we just inherited a spooky haunted house? Yes. The things we saw in that house, I mean, at one point we took some girls from church here, some it's from church, about five or six girls. They wanted to come for school holidays, and then they went home. And these kids were screaming at night, screaming, screaming, screaming like screaming. Went to the bedroom. Stones were falling from the ceiling. Did you tell the kids who in their power? No. We said sorry. We, we took the stones and said, just sorry. We uh, laid hands on the cheese and said, sleep well. <laughs> we were in the kitchen sometime. She's she, she, she cooking there. Whenever she cooks, we go to the kitchen seat too. That's been, and we did it for many years. So some pots are beginning to explode. Like pots are going boom. And Joyce goes, she's cool. She's, hey. We are yelling to our <laughs> She goes like, no, you stop it. You stop it. You stop it. Okay? Stop it. My food, stop it. When I'm up a window, I don't to get it. And then, one day we come from church. The house is locked. But in the... This wooden displays, what is the room divider? The glasses are all smashed inside. Everything inside is smashed. But the, the, the glass door itself is okay. Who the devil wanted to make us run? He meant to make us to run. He was there to make sure we don't stay. And then, then, then um, they, they, we used to have an elderly man, I saw to an, a very wonderful man, that Tim Lezana. Then they, we invite them, Mom, Lezani, Mom Lezani is still around, we invite them to our home there, and they come, and Tim Lezani, when we leave, she's, he stands right at the front door. Then he stands there, and he says, I see people here. He used to be very prophetic. I see people here. He explains the nationality of the people. They're not happy. And he doesn't know about the spooks. So we keep it cool and just say, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Then one night I'm sleeping. Our bedroom used to be right down the passage. I'm sleeping in the bedroom there. And then, um, no, let me not go to the other one first. One night I'm praying in the lounge. What's the one? Unless you stand on the word, you need to stand on the word. I'm telling about 
about horror movie stuff. And we, all we heard was the word. I'm sitting at the lounge, in the lounge, praying. I have an experience. The, the wall on my left, I say, I can see the corner. The house was the second house on the corner. I see the corner of the, the, corner of the street. A gentleman, average size gentleman, he's wearing black trousers, um, painted leather, black shoes, white shirt. He's holding a dog, a, a doberman dog with a nice chain. He's coming. He's coming, and they enter into the house, and as soon as they enter, they're real. And then this dog is like so angry. It pins me to the sofa. The dog just pins me to the sofa and breathes into my mouth. Okay? Like literally into my face. Like and this man is just in there and he is actually like uh, he smack on his face. But yeah, so what? And then I say in Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. And then some, some, some supernatural power comes over me. Tabang. I grab the dog by the, by, the, by the snout. Turns its neck and the neck the neck like goes and the dog falls down and he drags it. As he drags it, he moves out and he goes. And you go like, again, stop praying, go to bed. That's what I did. I'm going to see more than that. Then the next morning I tell Uchua is about the situation. Then, a few days later, I'm sitting there praying and all of a sudden, there's an evil presence. But I hear footsteps from the kitchen. There's footsteps. They come and they stand next to me. And there's immediately an intimidating evil presence. You could see, I could see a figure in silhouette. Let's see if you know, just like, yeah. Then I say, Satan, I know it's you. You go in Jesus' name. He turns around, goes down the passage where our bedroom was. Fine. I go to sleep again. The next morning, I say to Joyce, hey, man. Last night, I had an experience around Boma Wan. Then she says, first, let me tell you what happened. She says to me, around one in the morning, I was asleep. I thought it was you coming to bed. And somebody came, opened the door, and went into the blanket. And, but I, I was restless. When I turned, I found out there was no one near. And, and I said, Satan, get out of this bed. And, and the person literally woke up, walked over here, left through the, the window. And now you're sitting there, Masalwane, and all you're looking is Skamane Sidwene Pogo, Ingo Yamahala. It's either you run or you're going to rent somewhere. So, <laughs> so thank God for the word, because we stood our ground. We won battle after battle after battle after battle. And then, there's so much, so much. Then at one night I'm sleep, was sleeping in our bedroom, and I I'm able to see you know all the visions, and I'm able to see the whole passage at the house. Ne? I see myself coming out of the bedroom. There's a passage which leads to the lounge. There's two bedrooms on the left. There's a bathroom here. Then I see flies, a lot of flies, big flies. I see flies raining from the ceiling. Now this is in a dream. It's raining flies. The whole passage is full of green flies. Then in the dream, I'm trying to walk, but whenever I try to step, then the place only where I step, it becomes clean. So there's flies I'm trying to walk in. Then I tell to us about this funny dream. I say, you know what? I, mean, I saw flies in this house. Within two or three days, we wake up in the morning. Guess what? Flies, the whole passage. And you know, flies in the Bible signify demonic spirits. There's flies in the, in the... So we started to sweep them. Had it not been for the word, we would have run. But we swept the flies, we flushed them into the toilet. More flies came, flushed them into the... More flies. The last flies that, which came happy, I'm not kidding, they were the size of my thumb. There were 13 in all. In the, in the, in the, bath, in the bathroom. Kids were no longer bathing, they saw because as kids were in the bathroom, the flies would be falling, like literally falling. So kids had to come and bath in our bathroom. So but the last time they came, we woke up in the morning and I'm going to the toilet and there's about 13 of them. 
Then I called to Esther, I showed her the flies, and I picked them up one by one into the bucket. I flushed them all away. And the things we saw, the temptations, the troubles, the trials, the threats from the realm of the spirit, the things which would have uh, made us want to go to some papa somewhere, we won the battles through the word. We fought, we fought, and all we had was the word. We spoke the word, we acted according to our faith. We stood our ground, we refused to run. We ended up saying, devil, you will only come back here the day we've left. And we never ran out of that house. We stayed until there was a buyer for the house. Then the buyer came, some beggars are smiling. I don't know whether, <laughs> what happened to them, but they were excited about a new house. We were never chased out of the house. We stayed, I think, more than a year or so. By the time we moved, about two years we moved out, we were already going to build our other house. And what I'm trying to say to you today is, if you listen to the word, the first thing that goes is fear. Fear is always based on someone else's word and not on God's word. We refuse, we refuse to run, we refuse to run, we refuse to run, we refuse to run. We refused to run. When we built our other church, our first church up there, I would find in the passage, in, in the trenches, Takereke, those young men who were there back then can tell you, I would find in the trenches, with dark trenches, there would be ZCC badges in the trenches. I don't know, can you say the cookie cast stick? That's easy, Pesh is in the trenches. They can cook a car also. Did he manana so? Did he get a mother to build? We knew what it, the battle was not ours, the battle was the Lord's. And God is going to win the battle only if He finds people who know the word, who will stand. Stand their ground, stand their ground, stand their ground. It does not have to look like we are winning yet, but stand the ground until the battle is over. And that's how we won battles. Many other battles. Well, since we came to the Lord, it's been a, a, an adventure in Christ. I told you how I had a car, BMW 518. I laid hands on that car. I did motor mechanic at, me mechanics at school. The car needed rings and bearings. It had an engine knock. It was smoking all over the place. But I was bankrupt. So I, I one day, brothers, I one day said, God, you created everything. Now, until you are desperate, you'll never know what I mean. God, you created everything. God, the engine A comes from the aluminum that you created many years ago. God, everything in this car, you created. I was desperate. Desperate. I laid hands on the car called BMW in Jesus' name. Got the engine knock, you stop in Jesus' name. That car I drove for the next two, six months or so, no smoke, no engine knock, nothing, until we exchanged it for something else. You will keep listening and keep being surprised and keep questioning and keep being skeptic until you stand your own ground. Until you stand your own ground, you will never know the impact of the word of God. Was not testimony because how not to melo. Mamela about what you can say it's a hale. You stand your ground. Last week I said, if I said when hope starts around people who have hope, don't stick around failures. Don't stick about people who wanted to transfer your faith, your focus from Jesus to something else. Refuse to be captured in Jesus' name. Refuse. I'm not going to run. That's why even when we came here, you know the battles we had here? I never stood there and announced them to the church. You can say what they were linked to the focus. We faced battles. Some of you know the battles we faced 
just to have church here, I would run around Gili one. Run around, I shut my mouth, I come here, I speak the word. During the week, fought battles from court to court, from kangaroo court to kangaroo court. I've been all over the place. I faced lawyers who were prepared that this church will never be built here, offering their services for free. Offering them for free, literally, about the same for free. And I would say, if God wants us to build a church, it shall be built. But I said, I'm not going to send fear in the camp. I'm not going to send fear in the camp. I said that I'm not going to. I'll tell them about the victories, not about the battles. Because I don't want to be amongst people who be afraid. Because you win one battle, you're ready for the next battle. You win two battles. Ready for the third one. You win the third one, you're ready for the fourth one. The more you win, it's addictive. You can never stop. And you don't want to send fear at all. Next time, you're going to be in the next one. Next one. I'll be all over. All over. All over. It was bad. It was bad. Everybody was against this whole project. Including people you'd actually esteem high. At one point, the fence, 500 meters, yeah, fence from the gate all the way was destroyed. Came here, they bent the shake, yarunamanka, everything. Did we tell you? No. You didn't come here for that. It would be better to have you faithful or full of faith than fear of, full of fear. I called a few men around the church and I said, let's, let's patrol this place like what Nehemiah did. We shall build this church. And this very structure, so one and say, say I work about by 13. This whole thing. 13 guys who worked here Monday to Friday to build this whole thing. And we were told it can never be done. Told by engineers. Engineers who work with wood, Barry, where have you seen a structure that high? But do you know the pole is 12 meters? So when I work at 18 meters, where, how are you going to do it? Are you an engineer? I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but I knew I had a vision. So no engineer was prepared to help us until the structure was up. The first engineer to come here with 30 years' experience, he stood there and he said to us, Who did this structure? Ramon and I, it's our pastor. Are he, is he an engineer? I don't know. Are, are, this is the best I have seen in years. Where do I stand? He took the plan and endorsed his signature. Moyan. Faith. Stand your ground. Refuse to run. Say no to anything that will steal your faith. Never look down on yourself. You might be small, but your God is big enough. Yes. It can only happen with your permission. But I refuse to give the devil an opportunity. I choose to stand on the word. I have learned that the word works. Therefore, I'm not going to abandon. I cannot fail at this point. I'm not going to abandon my faith. What kills the church today is greed, being materialistic, and prayerlessness. That's the disease that the church is suffering from in these days. The church is suffering from a disease called greed, being materialistic, and prayerlessness. That's why the church is dying. We want to wake up to a new day, but we don't want to toil in prayer the night before. We want a miracle. So who's going to perform a miracle? What if that miracle must be pulled down from heaven by yourself?
know what? Let's leave it here. Let's leave it right here. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. He sent his word and healed their diseases, the word says.